Interesting. That was very different. Welcome to Coffee with Coach Rody. Uh, today we did a little poll last night for which coffee we we're going to open today. Had a landslide vote of three total: two for caffeine and hate, and one for something else I can't remember. Anyway, caffeine and hate from uh, the purchase through Black Rifle Coffee Company. Um, is a partner product with a, a Ranger Up. And today we're going to drink out of our Skull Chalice tankard from 1776 United. And as you can tell, this coffee's a little different from what I've been drinking. I've been on a real big uh, coffee or die kick the last uh, month or so. And that one is a bit on the lighter side. Still kind of an old taverny warehouse taste. This coffee um, is very dark. Dark and smooth. Uh, there's light essence, okay? When you smell the bag, all right, the bag I get like an old fruit crate with bright flowers type of smell. And even off the top of the off the mug here, you're getting bright, bright scents, almost uh, floral and fruit smells. But the taste is very dark, smoky. Um, I'm picking up like a like a, a hardwood, applewood smoking uh, charcoal flavor coming off this coffee. And there's some, something else in there, a little bit. A 
they're coffee experts would probably define that as a, a nuttiness in there, but there's, um, I'd say it's just a, it's a, an earthy taste and there's something you want to say kind of mechanic about the, the overall flavor. Mechanic in the way of brake dust, diesel exhaust, something like that is kind of essencing off this coffee. It's very good. This is this is a very good coffee. I, one of my one of my favorites right off the bat. Usually a favorite coffee of mine. It takes a while to develop. This right off the bat, I like it. I also really like this uh, this tanker. This is another hand thrown tanker from 1776 United. And um, the problem with today's society is that we no longer drink from the skulls of our enemies, um, conquered enemies. This reminds me of a, a story by um, Wedby out of uh, the Carolinas, and he has a story called um, Blackbeard's Cup. And it's a great little story um, about a young man going on a, a day adventure in the summertime, and uh, kind of reminds me of this, this, this mug here. The handle, we've got the nice big handle, a slight angle to it, um, so it, it's it's nice uh, nice in the hand, kind of standard from, from 1776. And uh, at first I thought the, 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 the flare top to this mug was going to be a little bit too small, but it's just the right size. Okay, this is smaller than the Washington Headquarters mug. Um, same style, it's a little bit steeper on the rim than the Washington mug but it's a much smaller diameter than that one. It's a bit taller. Um, it, it's very, it's kind of nice um, apothecary, cauldron-ish. Um, really sends the, the uh, flavor and the essence up into your nose, but gives you that nice, wide, um, flat, river-flowing drinking uh, experience that I, I really like. This is quickly becoming one of my favorite mugs uh, in the collection. Now, <clears throat> we did a vote for which coffee we we're going to open today, and along with that, I said, well, let's do some of the requested topics. So, uh, Matt Marcosha, who was uh, an athlete of mine several years ago, a uh, Canadian shot putter, was an uh, athlete at Finley University in Ohio, um, fantastic young man, had a lot of fun working with him, uh, very bright, very... Um, kind and the type of guy you don't you don't find around these days very much. Uh, he wanted to talk about. I got some note cards today because these, these are specifics. Uh, he wanted to talk about overrated coffees and underrated coffees. Um, so I guess first let's start with the uh, the overrated coffees. Anything sold pre-ground in a large plastic tub or a tin can is overrated. Because it's hardly coffee, right? Um, and you know what I'm talking about. Sometimes they're red, sometimes they're blue. These companies, this coffee is not coffee, okay? I link in this to, um, it's like drinking a desert, okay? Now, all coffee has diuretic compounds, right? It Generally, they're going to dehydrate your body, okay? Uh, Now, when I drink good coffee, who, yeah, this, this is this is some good stuff. When I drink good coffee, uh, I get a very um, kind of a very even caffeine exposure, and I it improves my overall mood, not just my energy level, but also my mood. Okay, um, and I don't get a a dehydration effect per se. Like I don't really notice it as long as I'm drinking water. Uh, with these big tub ground pre-ground coffees, it's like drinking a desert. It just robs me of all of my liquids. I feel like I'm just drinking sand. I can just feel the water coming out of my, out of my body. When the caffeine hit, it, it improves your energy, but not the not your mood. Right? There's just there's no essence to it. There's no flavor. There's no floral aspects in your nut in your nose, um, and. Uh, some of these coffees, okay, some of the lower grade coffees, even, I've had uh, thyroid or glandular issues with them, okay? 
I've even had this with whole bean coffees that I purchased that were lower price points. And as soon as I start drinking them, my glands and my neck get all swollen up and sore for a few days. But when I have good coffee, that has never happened once. So you tell me what's going on with these uh, bulk coffees that are cheaper than dirt. Is it just drinking dirt? Are you drinking chemical dirt? I don't know, but I've had issues uh, from drinking some of that low end stuff. Uh, now for overrated coffee, underrated coffee, let's, I wanna touch on Starbucks a little bit here, okay? Starbucks used to be my go-to when I was on the road. Okay, I liked Starbucks coffee, it was pretty good. You know, it, it did the job. Uh, I'm hard pressed to go to Starbucks anymore. When I'm out and about, I, I cannot find coffee that is better than what I make at home. Um, I mean, people's ratios are all messed up. Their qual their water sources are all messed up. I cannot find a good coffee, and I Starbucks used to be my, my go-to. They're not anymore. Um, I don't really have a go-to per se anymore. Um, and I think it's Starbucks quality has gone down. I don't think they're training employees the way they used to. I think the focus on product has gone away from actual coffee and more into specialized drinks that are just a bunch of mix-ins and the actual coffee ingredient doesn't really matter. Um, and one of the worst um, incidents I had, actually the, 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 when I drew the line for Starbucks was I ordered a pour over. I was like, okay, I think they didn't have my, the drip coffee I wanted. And I said, okay, we'll do a pour over, right? And so they get the, the grounds and they do the pour over and they get it all set up and they pour in a whole bunch of water. I was like, oh man, this is going, going to go fast. Pour in a whole bunch of water and they walked away and did some more of the orders. And the water worked its way through the grounds. It came to the bottom and they came back and they poured more in. And they walked over, did some more orders. And they came back a third time and they put more water in until the, the level of brewed coffee got up to the required amount in the cup. And they pulled it off and gave it to me. And it might as well, they might as well have been killing baby ducks. It was like, it, to treat coffee that way in a pour over matter is, is heresy, okay? Real pour over requires a gooseneck kettle or a very steady hand and it, it needs a constant flow, constant water flow for the duration of, of the brew, which typically uh, is about two and a half minutes, okay? You can kind of go a minute, a minute less, a minute more based on how much you're doing, but you can't go over four minutes at all for a pour over. You're gonna start getting really acidic coffee. Um, so if you're ever at a coffee shop and you wanna order yourself a, a pour over, and if they don't stand there for the entire two and a half minutes, maintain a constant flow, they either don't care about their coffee or they don't care about their quality and customer retention, because that's not pour over anymore. That's just slopping grounds and water together. Okay. Um, so that was my experience with Starbucks. No longer in favor and all over pour over. Also, the, the coffee is, tastes really, really burnt now. I, anyway, uh, underrated coffees. Now, Matt, I had a really hard time coming up with an underrated coffee because we're in a coffee age. People are, are enjoying coffee and, and the information age and having your own website and social media. I think good products get attention, right? They get talked about and they get the notoriety they, they deserve. Uh, so, uh, I think light roast coffees are tend to be maybe underappreciated. Um, dark roast coffees, uh, people who like dark roast. Now, there is a place for dark roast, but uh, historically, now I think I learned this from Townsend's. Okay, Townsend's is a uh, colonial clothing and pottery company and they have a YouTube channel and they got a pretty good coffee guy on their on their videos and I think I learned this from them where dark roast was invented in Europe and it's because they were shipping coffee over on the boats and they'd fill the boat up with coffee and the bottom of the boats is always full of leaking water and and rat feces and kind of whatever else would fall to the bottom of a ship during trans ocean travel right so you can imagine what the bottom bags would have been like and instead of throwing that cargo out, the roasters, I think they said it was in France, maybe, I'm not sure, but the roasters just burnt the shit out of the beans. And they called it dark roast coffee. Uh, and they sold it to the, the, as a lower price point to the lower classes as a dark roast coffee. And that's where it started. Okay, so typically 
light and medium roast is where you're going to get the flavor and the origins of the bean and and dark roast is kind of almost always falls flat okay now that has changed a little bit today but um i guess for an underrated coffee i think light and medium light medium light end of the medium roast are, are underappreciated in today's culture i think a lot of people say just dark roast dark roast i like dark roast um so that's my answer for you matt now uh, Nathan Fanger, throws coach at Kent State, he put a comment up on the very first video we ever did, which was the NCAA uh, recruiting process. And uh, Fanger and I go way back. I did a, a mentorship with him. Um, my senior year of high school, the last month of, of school, if you're in good standing, you can go out and have a job shadow project in the community to kind of see what you're going to want to do after, after college, you know. And, um, I, I couldn't figure out what I wanted to do and finally my mom said well why don't you go shadow the throws coach at Kent like you you like him and you know you might want to do coaching and so I did and it was a life-changing experience fantastic that was the spring of 2003 he was a brand new coach then and um, uh, he and I have maintained friendship over the years and um, now I live 15 minutes from Kent and and we see each other on a fair, fairly often basis and he asked about flavored coffees, okay? Now, I, I kind of teased him a bit and said, I'm gonna, never gonna talk about flavored coffees because I think that's heresy too when it comes to, you know, coffee should be black. Black only, uh, preferred hot, cold brews okay on the right occasion. Um, so, okay, flavored coffees. If you're gonna flavor your coffee, I would prefer that you micrograde an ingredient either on top of the poured coffee or into your beans before you brew the beans, okay? Now, if you're gonna put it in the beans before brew, make sure that the temperature of the water isn't just gonna burn the crap out of that ingredient and it's gonna turn acidic on you or, or bitter or, or, or anything like that. So I think probably preferred you micrograde ingredients after uh, uh, pre-roasted coffees like you know so a lot of times people will they'll put a little bit of a vanilla flavor or a, a fruit additive in with the beans when they roast them okay so we're going in order here right so micro graded ingredients would be first preference second preference is is, uh, pr is uh, flavor roasted with the beans now this goes for more natural things not like the French vanilla and the hazelnut coffees those are those are kind of a different they're not really getting the flavors from just putting a little additive, putting a hint of flavor in there. They're putting like a full on, um, you know, syrup on their beans or, you know, whatever they're doing. It's a full on uh, flavor, flavor up, upgrade. Um, I'm not too much of a fan of those, but, uh, and then creamer additives. Okay. If you're putting cream in your coffee, a 50, 50, half and half is okay. I prefer full fat cream. If you're going to put it in, you just put a little bit in. Uh, the creamer additives, uh, those are the worst. I, I can't stand them. Uh, I think if you're going to drink those, you might as well drink them with black syrup or a tea or just on their own with hot water because you're not going to taste hardly any of the coffee, right? The coffee with that creamer is, is, uh, is, is secondhand and you could be drinking any kind of quality coffee and it's going to taste the same, right? Um, now I did want to say pre-roasted, micro-grade. Oh, my personal favorite coffee additive. Now, when I want to get fancy, sometimes I'll foam up some milk. And I'll put that, that in with a little bit of cinnamon if I'm feeling kind of fancier. But otherwise, my favorite coffee additive is straight up black coffee and whiskey. Favorite coffee additive. Uh, <laughs> let's see, then Fanger also asked about the left leg function in rotation. Okay, I typically try and stay away from technique talk, it, you know, uh, on camera or in discussion boards because you have to be there in person to really talk about it in field positions and stuff. But um, I can give you guys a rundown on what I think the left leg needs to be doing during the throw. This is for a right-handed thrower, okay? Um, on the entry point, the left leg is your balance point. It's not your hinge point it's not the point that you push off of and angle into the circle it is a hundred percent balance like you're on a ball bearing lazy susan around one spot okay door hinge and you come around that left leg everything in the body comes around it not over top of it right 
the left knee can drop, the left knee can drop towards the center of the circle, but it doesn't allow the left, it doesn't allow the hips or the leg or the body to angle in. Okay, everything stays straight up and down. Uh, now, when you, so you, uh, you gotta go around that left leg, and at the very start, I tell my people you want left hand and the left toe to go to 90 degrees before you get your right foot going, and that way that left leg, it stays neutral uh, as your pivot point, but it also sets up the initial stretch reflex in the hips and the legs to start that frictional energy to get the, the body coming around, to get that right leg active as the active uh, motor for that first step. Now in the middle, that left leg, okay, once your right foot touches down, um, I like almost no air time. There should be like maybe one frame of film between the right foot touchdown and the left leg takeoff. Uh, and as soon as that left leg takes off, okay, it stays out, it stays out wide. This is your, this is your right leg in the center, this is your left leg in the back. And as that left leg rotates up, it stays equidistant from the right side in the middle. It does not come in close to the body, it stays out wide. Now a lot of that is if, if you've done the rotation properly, you've got the ball up in the center, you've got the, your body rotating, you need to counterbalance so you don't fall into the bucket. And that left leg acts like a cougar's tail or a tiger's tail, right? You gotta keep it out wide and it keeps you balanced on center with the shot over the right toe in rotation without having to pivot and pitch and and fall all over the place because any any added movement is going to decrease your your speed right so that's what the left leg has to do in the middle and then uh, as it comes into the into the ground strike at the front it's the lead it's the lead of the balance transfer to get up to the front to deliver the throw uh, once it comes down it stays grounded and uh, yeah it's the lead to the strike it stays grounded on the on the cement and um, it's the main push point right at the, at the final moment of strike the peak power point you should feel power from the left toe box of the shoe all the way up across your body and out the right hand that's where the main push is coming from it's not coming from the right foot out the right hand it's the left foot out the right hand that's the main power line okay so if you're not feeling that you're not balanced enough and Mac Wilkins you know he talked for years, he talks about being on balance, on balance. And I didn't know what that was when I was a younger thrower. But when I started throwing far, I realized what he was talking about being on balance. And on balance means throwing from the ground, throwing on your feet, not just not just not being wobbly in your rotations, but actually throwing from one foot to another, creating energy off of one foot. Um, or rather maintaining your energy off of one foot. Um, and then throughout the throw, the left leg, uh, in general, it stays bent and it barely changes angle on the body, okay? From the whole point of the entry, carrying it through the middle, to when it lands at the front, to through the final moment of the strike. Um, that left leg, it the knee angle doesn't change and the whole attitude of the leg does not change very much. It all right, we got cut short by an in incoming call there, but I, that was the last comment. We're going to wrap it up anyway. A longer video today. Um, thank you for those who hung in to the end. Uh, we got some big stuff happening with Roadie Sport this fall. Okay, we're going to start doing uh, some more product product giveaways, um, different type of uh, uh, contests, and we're going to we're going to be releasing a few new products, uh, specifically those tailored for. Uh, high school throwers, high school coaches, and then we've got some big events coming uh, this fall and uh, some, some uh, big projects this winter. So if you're not uh, following us on social media, get over to Instagram, give us a, a follow, subscribe, click the subscribe button here on YouTube so you get all the, 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 the videos coming up. Um, we're going to have some releases, uh, dates to be on the lookout for in the future. We're going to have a a big date on Halloween, a big date on Thanksgiving, and uh, we got a date coming up in December. Okay, we're gonna have a live video release on uh, Saturday, tomorrow, Saturday, uh, 7 p.m. What's the date today? 
22nd, so the 23rd of August, I think, Saturday, 7 p.m. Eastern. We're going to do a live session. We're going to have a big announcement uh, for the Ohio and uh, surrounding area for the throws. Um, all right, until next time, uh, don't buy the big tubs of coffee. Buy the whole bean bag coffees. <laughs>